Okay, uh, chapter three, menopause. Well, it's generally considered a condition of estrogen and progesterone deficiency, and what about testosterone? Dihydrotestosterone, DHEA, androstenedione, pregnenolone. It's a lot more that meets the eye. The psychological impact of deficiency with estrogen dominance, as we'll be discussing, progesterone dominance, which is a rare occurrence, and testosterone deficiency. Uh, when the patient comes in, this is in the book, uh, what we do is take a full menstrual history uh, to start things off. And then there's a menopause rating scale. Everybody uses something like this or something akin to that. Okay. And what we've developed is a composite of about uh, nine uh, different uh, questionnaires and deals with uh, sexual function. And this is male, female, so don't want to confuse you. Um, females have their section since this is on menopause. Uh, mental functioning, metabolic changes. The three areas that we cover, regardless of the hormone, are psychological, physiological, and physical, because they're all interactive, and therefore we want to assess the patient's from the three different areas. Um, irritable male, irritable female, these are the psychological, there are 50 questions on this. And what happens is we send out a packet to the patients and they come in with the packets filled out, hopefully in most cases, and just going through them, you already know what's going on in the majority of cases. And there's a rating scale. And it's funny, I had uh, a guy fill this out, and they were mostly never and occasionally. And then we put him on treatment, and comes back once, well, once a month, and by about the third month that he's in, he says, you know that questionnaire on irritability? I'd like to refill it out. I said, fine. He refills it out, and it's almost all frequent or almost constantly. And it took me a minute to figure out what just happened. And what it was, was because of his depression and his sense of insecurity and a lack of a plum and all that stuff, he didn't want to present how he really felt. And now he was feeling so good because his hormones, which were almost totally gone, had been corrected, he was feeling wonderful. In women, what I'm starting to see, and it's going to be added, it's going to be added to this, is agoraphobia. I see women with agoraphobia as one of the presentations of anxiety, panic attack, hypochondriacal personality, um, hyperventilation syndrome. And I have two or three patients uh, who have agoraphobia, and it was, I didn't ask them, you know, do you have agoraphobia? What happened was they started doing physical activities outside the house. And I started asking, uh, I mean, why weren't you doing it before? I didn't feel comfortable leaving the house. Classical early symptom of agoraphobia. So asking these things, you'll learn a lot. Agoraphobia, I only see in women who have um, testosterone deficiency. Well, not to bore you with some of the basics, but estrone, uh, I think the most important aspect of estrone, it's one of the estrogens. Oh, no one asked me on the on the cover of the book, I think you can see it a lot better on the, remove the jacket on the inside. What are those three molecules there? What are those chemical structures? There are three estrogens, E1, E2, E3. That's my three daughters. Each one of them classically fits each one of the estrogens. <laughs> Two in medical school, uh, one in medical school, one pre-med and one going into law. Geez, who's going to pay for me in the future? Anyway, the issue with estrone, the key is it's not a product that is meaningless in the body. It has a function. It's an intermediate pool. If you look at any of the cascades of hormones, you'll see there's a double arrow from testosterone, a single arrow, testosterone down to estradiol. And between estradiol and estrone, there's a double arrow. Where do you get estriol from? You get it from estrone. You don't get it from estradiol. So estrone has to serve a function. 
in estrone has to be sulfonated in order for it to go into an active pool. That's how it can go back to estradiol. So if you have good sulfa donating products in your female body, if they're deficient, and you can do it by amino acid testing out of urine, you don't have to necessarily give the patient uh, estradiol. Also, if you find a woman who has high levels of estrone, low levels of estradiol, and um, low levels of estrel, it might be a case where she needs methionine, cysteine, or one of the sulfa donating amino acids. And without having to give her estradiol, you can fix the system. It's the same thing with reduced glutathione. Reduced glutathione has three amino acids in it. You take it by mouth, it gets broken down into three component uh, amino acids, gets absorbed, and in the blood gets reconstructed as long as you have the sulfa in it. So that's why you'll hear people saying it's worthless taking reduced glutathione, but reduced glutathione is phenomenal for skin, helps with uh, um, lipofusion, it removes um, oxidized fat from under the skin, lipofusion. It's a phenomenal antioxidant for the eyes and for the brain. Phenomenal. And estrone comes from uh, the convert version of DHEA cholesterol, pregnenolone, DHEA, androstenedione. dione. Androstene dione trifurcates into testosterone DHT directly and estrone. So if you do a baseline test and you do in a woman with estrone and estradiol, I don't do estriol anymore, and you see a disproportionate increase in estrone, what's happening is if they're on DHEA as every woman should be, um, what's happening is they uh, either have an enzyme block or else uh, you're giving them too much and it's going down that pathway. E2, I really don't need to say anything more. There are some articles I'll show you on the genotoxicity. We now know specifically where the 4 and 16 hydroxy works at um, guanosine and creates the genotoxicity and mutation. And by using things like DIM and uh, indole 3 carbonyl. When you take indole 3 carbonyl, it hits the hydrochloric acid in the gut and converts to DIM. Estriol, I think one of the most important things in estriol, other than it's the number one estrogen in a pregnant female, is the fact that UCLA has been doing some studies for the past six years on the benefits of estriol in, in, huh? MS. Correctamente, in MS, major study. So if you have a patient with MS, you want to preference them, take them out of the usual mundane treatment programs that we all fall into, and customize it to increase the amount of estriol in the patient. You can go to UCLA and look at their MS center and pick up all the research that's being done. Progesterone, extremely important. I mean, for the life of me, I can't understand why, after a woman has a hysterectomy, why the only poison they put into her body is permanent. Didn't the body have a balance between estrogens and progesterone? Why do we shift it away? When you're estrogen dominant, PMS, perimenopausal emotional conditions, GABA is decreased, glutamine, all the cerebral or the brain uh, hormones that regulate sense of well-being, calm, are gone. That's why women that are on estrogen or have estrogen dominance for whatever reason have, you know, bouncing off the wall is what I call it. Also, low, testo low um, testosterone level can do the same. Testosterone, I mean, I still have to this day women coming into the office and I have a DVD which is the patient discussion, where they, we watch a, not DVD, a, a PowerPoint presentation where we go through, you know, hormones, a little background, why we replace it, and blah, blah, blah. It takes about 20 minutes. And I still have, when I hit the testosterone slide, I still have women saying, women need testosterone too? They don't get, I mean, they don't understand it. How, and their gynecologists have failed to educate them that it's not just estrogen. It's not just progesterone, it's everything.